representatives from New Approach to the table. Ms Fielding. Thank you. Thank you. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses giving evidence to Senate committees has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full names and the capacity in which you appear today? Kate Fielding, CEO of A New Approach. Wonderful. Would you like to give us an opening statement? Yes, thank you, Senator. Australia can become a cultural powerhouse whose compelling creativity is locally loved, nationally valued and globally influential. A New Approach, Australia's independent arts and culture think tank, welcomes Australia's new cultural policy, Revive, as a good next step towards reaching that potential. Our research involving Middle, Australia, middle Australians living in outer suburban and regional locations in every state and territory shows everyday Australians in, believe arts and culture are core to being Australian and indeed being human, essential to connection and cohesion. Middle Australians aged 18 to 75 believe that a world without arts and culture would lack colour, expression and freedom. This perception of benefits is matched by a high rate of participation and by credible international and Australian research confirming those benefits. Transparent, targeted and coordinated expenditure by governments helps ensure all Australians can access these personal and public benefits. Cultural policies exist in various forms at local, state, territory and federal levels, both in formal documents such as Revive, as well as through programs, activities, investments and stated policy positions. I want to highlight this to you today because all three levels of government are active and important in this space. Here come the figures. As a proportion of total non-COVID cultural funding contributed by the three levels of government in 2020-2021, the Commonwealth contributed 38 per cent, the states and territories 37 per cent and local governments 25 per cent. This $7.2 billion was directed to the full spectrum of arts and cultural activity across the country. However, cultural funding is not keeping up with population growth. Since 2007, the Australian population has grown by 20 per cent, while cultural expenditure by governments has increased by only 10 per cent. Australia now ranks 23rd out of 31 OECD countries for government spending on recreation, culture and religion as a percentage of total GDP. Growing total financial inflows from government, philanthropic, industry and consumer sources is important for fostering creative cultural activity, but so is focused and effective use of existing funding across all three tiers of government. To this end, and as outlined in our submission, a new, a new approach believes progressing the Productivity Commission inquiry recommended by a multi-partisan committee in 2021 would be worthwhile to inform the development of future policy and investment decisions. Likewise, we think that further work to foster more intentional and coordinated cross-portfolio investment would be fruitful in the long term. These actions are part of Australia's journey towards becoming a cultural powerhouse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Pleasure. You've raised something I, I did want to explore, which is that cross-portfolio piece. Um, we frequently hear from people you know, um, this particular art or cultural piece is about health or it's about um, social inclusion or it's about whatever other portfolio and the expectation that then it should be funded from those portfolios. Obviously, the observation of the portfolios are about their core intention being health rather than arts or culture. So it's a really difficult piece because, yes, there's um, amazing benefits in all sorts of areas, particularly in that sort of health and social space, um, where arts and culture is so valuable uh, in terms of giving people an opportunity to grow and, and experience those things without being challenged or limited by their health status, their social status, etc. Um, so how, how do you, as a, as a, you know, 
a think tank in this space, which is great. How do you see that conceptually? So there's two points that I'd like to make there. Firstly, in that uh, year that I was talking about, 21, 20, sorry, 2020, 21, there were 100 agencies and departments at those three levels of government who uh, re reported cultural funding. So, so 100. 100. That tells us that this is already happening across um, a fairly broad part of uh, government activity. I'd also highlight that uh, we uh, were able to analyse the French government's um, accounts, and they um, release a really deep one of it's a really globally significant thing. They release a detailed set of accounts that allow us to see the cultural funding in portfolios that are not the culture portfolio. The OECD has highlighted this, and the majority of cultural funding in France comes from outside the culture portfolio. My point there is we are, to some extent, already uh, doing that cross-portfolio work. It would be wonderful if it was uh, made more transparent in terms of that clarity around where that, uh, where that investment is coming from and the purposes behind it. I think there's some real benefits to being uh, more able to see what is already happening um, to help inform that very, very needed conversation about cross-portfolio intentions and investment in this space. Mm. So that comes to your point in your opening statement about intentional activity. Absolutely. Um, as opposed to uh, the more... Oh, I'll just say unintentional because the better word isn't coming to my head. Um, <laughs> Of those incidental. incidental, we'll use that. I was going to use a much more negative word, and I thought I really shouldn't. So, um, so with those 100 agencies, have you done any analysis across that as to what inspired them to do it? Whether it was just from discretionary type grant funding, or I'd love to do that analysis. That information is not released. So, who those agencies are is not released as part of the data set. Ah, okay. Just the fact that there's 100 of them. Oh, okay. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, when you were talking about expenditure and percentage of um, uh, GDP or whatever that we're spending, um, so Australia's ranked 23rd out of 34 OECD countries? Uh, 23rd out of 31. Out of 31. Yeah, for the, for the ones that report that information. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, has that moved around much over the years? For the, uh, for the years for which we have data, we are um, decreasing at a greater rate than the rest of the OECD countries, so we're, we're falling behind. Okay. That's not good, is it? Um, you also talk about identifying a target for government expenditure. Um, how would you see that being scoped? So we think this is the type of uh, work that we think needs to be done over the long term. Um, so we've, in our submission, suggested that that might be work that the Productivity Commission could, um, could review. I guess the key point there is this is a serious part of uh, Australia's culture and society. And while the pol this new policy is terrific, um, there's still gains to be made in taking a intentional and serious approach, utilising some of those mechanisms within government to try and answer the questions of are we being effective? How can we make this more targeted? What is the purpose that we're trying to do? If we've got 100 agencies across three levels of government, it's clearly an area of active interest. Um, how can we better inform that interest? Mm. Um, so with um, the funding and the structures that are, that are in uh, the NCP, do you, do you feel like that's going to make a significant difference? I think that the uh, new cultural policy is very much a supply side policy and that's terrific. It's explicit about the fact that that's where its focus is, that it's a sector focused policy. I think that there's some really great measures in that. I would signal, and I, and I hope our submission conveys that, that it is a first, it's a, it's a next step, it's not a first step. It's obviously building on many things. It's a next step in this process. and. My encouragement is that we treat it as a next step and treat a, the conversation as and what would the next step be. Um, 
to, to keep building on that. I think uh, that there was a question I heard uh, one of the committee members ask earlier about part bipartisanship. And if I said one thing back to you, it would be our multipartisanship that this is an area where there is real benefit to the Australian people in a um, multi-partisan approach. Uh, it really doesn't benefit from uh, being a political football. This is our culture, this is our society, this is our nation, and it really should sit in one of the things that we hold dear. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Davey. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks uh, for attending today, Ms Fielding, and um, thank you for your work. I read your reports and um, they're very insightful. Um, I just want to come back to that. If we're 23rd out of 31 in the OECD in terms of spending on culture, when you do that analysis, does that include the 100 agencies reporting cultural? So that is all the incidental out of portfolio of spending as well. Absolutely. Right, that puts it in a different light. Um, in your submission, uh, you talk about calling for better coordination. Is that what you're talking about when you want to see the cross portfolio, a bit more transparency there, but also a bit more um, intention behind cultural spending across portfolios? Is that the better coordination piece? The better coordination piece is definitely across portfolio and but also across levels of government. Uh, like you, Senator, I've spent most of my life living in regional Australia and have seen many instances where there's been uh, amazing regional development investment into cultural facilities that is not necessarily uh, matched or coordinated with um, the type of expenditure that's uh, recovered, required for the recurrent responsibilities there. And often those fall to either a state or territory or a local government. So when we talk about coordinated, it's about going, there is significant investment into this space. Uh, there is the opportunity for that to be better harnessed to support the opportunities for Australia, and that goes both cross government and cross portfolio. So, um, when you talk about sort of some of the investments in in regional, often they're facilities. So they're investments in like a new museum space or a new gallery space in a regional area. Are you sort of saying better coordination because it's not necessarily then matched by, um, yeah support putting things in it. Yeah, I think it's not a build it and they will come scenario. Absolutely. I think that taking a place based approach to cultural infrastructure would be a step forward. Um, the a place based approach to cultural infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So thinking about uh, cultural infrastructure and cultural access. So the opportunity to participate and contribute to a cultural life uh, right across the country, in our cities, in our outer suburbs, in our regional and remote communities. Uh, looking at that cultural infrastructure from both a build and on operating perspective and treating it as a central part of what uh, is expected in 21st century Australia. Our work with Middle Australia uh, tells us really strongly that access to culture in the place where you live and opportunities to participate and contribute is, a, is an expectation of our communities. You've done a lot of work in also trying to understand the value that the community puts on art and also um, the not just traditional art, getting, getting communities to, um, to put a value on arts experiences and sort of maybe the incidental exposure to the arts, which has been um, very informative. Have you also done work on the um, return on investment or potentially the multiplier impact of regional arts expenditure in particular because I know organisations I've worked with who literally operate on the smell of an oily rag, they don't have the opportunity to get the big audience income because they're also playing in areas with very low socioeconomic advantage, 
but then the multiplier effect for every person touched. So it's non-financial. Have you done any work on that? So there are excellent case studies done on that ROI piece. Uh, at the moment, we're uh, working on a piece looking at a conceptual ROI model. Um, I would say that this is an area which is um, of international interest and has not been solved, um, which is my polite way of saying that, uh, yes, there are excellent case studies that can be used um, and place-based case studies, um, the, um, but the, the kind of broader model of how we understand this um, is still an emerging area. I'm happy to provide, I'll notice, some, some examples of that ROI. I'd really appreciate that. Excellent. And I think it comes back to the whole, you know, we're so good at putting a dollar figure on everything, but sometimes the dollar figure is actually the wrong way to measure it. Mm. I, would, um, I would say just on that and picking up on your point about different communities, uh, with the most recent data that we've got, which is unfortunately 2016, um, looking at household consumption and cultural expenditure, um, for every dollar that governments, the three level of governments, uh, put into this space, there's four dollars of household consumption. And I guess I'd really emphasise that, that while uh, governments are an important uh, enabler, activator, um, investor, all of those things, um, it is actually... Uh, public consumption that is a significant financial inflow into this space as well. Right. Also in your work, um, have you looked at, and of course I focus on the regions, Yeah, you know, you know that's my area of interest, but have you looked at also the funding models that we have used prior to um, this na national cultural policy? Uh, and getting multi-year investment into regional organisations has anecdotally, to me, um, been more difficult. Have you done work on that piece? And do you advocate for, for more um, you know, multi-year funding opportunities for smaller um, regionally based organisations who don't necessarily have access to the really good grant writers or the, or the you know, other philanthropic avenues that are, are often centralised in our urban centres. We haven't done specific work in analysing whether it has changed in any way, but we have uh, identified that within this arts and culture broadly, and I want to keep emphasising I'm talking broadly about arts and culture, yeah. um, that within this industry there are long time frames um, for the development of skills, the um, recruitment of talent, the development, particularly in the instances where you're talking, um, where there may be a long, a, a long process to develop local audience, mm -hmm. um, as well as, as the process of developing um, product. The, a, trans, a lot of funding which is transactional in nature, so project-based in nature, um, relies on um, the infrastructure, the cultural infrastructure in a place, by which I mean the people and the buildings, mm -hmm which may not have the kind of stability that they need to skills. provide that, that long-term yeah. um, build for audience and for product, mm -hmm. um, which is, is a way of saying that this is a space where both uh, private and public investors generally recognise that there is a, a long-term approach required. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, Ms Fielding, with all of the research that New Approach has done, um, and some of those figures are very interesting, have you compared uh, creativity, culture, art to the public spending, government spending on sport? Great question. Uh, the answer to that is no, because there is not an excellent comparable data set available for sport. Mm. Um, there is some there is some estimates um, that I can draw on, but I will provide them on notice because they'll need some um, context to, <laughs> to help um, highlight where they are and aren't comparable. Mm. So, uh, I was quite taken by um, an article in the Canberra Times a few weeks ago um, where uh, the Chief Minister Andrew Barr had announced that the ACT government was going to spend money on a new um, theatre. And uh, to those who 
might suggest that that's not the role of government. He pointed out the several millions of dollars that goes from the ACT government to uh, the various football clubs. Um, and that the government, the state government doesn't spend, uh, the territory government didn't spend anything like that in, in terms of um, art and culture institutions. So, um, yes, if you could take on notice yes. some of that information, that would be, um, that would be helpful. Um, it strikes me that there's a lot of money going into our education uh, institutions, our schools, our after-school activities, our youth programs, uh, in terms of hard infrastructure. You know, there's a lot of public debate every bloody state election on whether a new stadium is going to be built or not, uh, and where should it be built. But where is the big debate about how much money should be spent on the new exhibition space or a new program that teaches kids how to write songs or play music or do art? I just. I, there must be ways you can draw that information. It's as I said. There's uh, we have looked into it before because it's obviously an area mm. of interest. Uh, the unfortunately, there's not excellent comparable data, mm. but we'll give you um, what we have mm. um, that will help inform that. If I may, uh, one of the things that I've found personally very interesting out of the um, extensive work we've done in the Middle Australia sentiment um, work is. Within uh, those communities, very clearly, uh, the idea that uh, sport is part of life is there, but also that arts and cultural opportunities are part of life. Uh, mm. This comes out really clearly in the conversations around children's opportun opportunity for children and young people to uh, develop well and live a good life in the places mm. where they live. Mm. Yes, I, you know, uh, some parents are spending their Saturday mornings taking their kids to soccer and other parents are spending their Saturday mornings taking their kids to dance classes. Sometimes you have parents doing both. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so, yes, I, it, the, the public is voting with their feet. But I'm, con I, I'm concerned that the, the public spending money side of it uh, doesn't seem to be matching, let alone the rhetoric. Um, The new approach uh, had previously had a call for a uh, creativity commission. Is that still um, a, a policy that you um, uh, uh, have or are promoting? I yep. know you've asked for a productivity commission review, yep. um, but I'm interested in how that dovetails to a creativity commission. So the idea of a creativity commission has one that has been around for a few years. I think that it uh, arose from the idea of looking at Sports Australia, the, or the Sports Commission, and looking at different mechanisms for fostering um, opportunities and access for um, people across Australia, as well as those pathways into um, professional opportunities. I think that is one mechanism, it's one model that could work quite well. Mm. Um, it's at this point, uh, the thing that we're focusing on is that Productivity Commission inquiry because we think that the it is so clear when we look at the figures that the three levels of government are significant players in this space mm. together, but not always in a particularly um, intentional way. Mm. And that's probably where there's a space of, of gain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Yes, Senator Cadell. It's not my home ground, arts and creative stuff. I've been immersing myself trying to get up to speed on that. You know, the definition I've come up with is the, I like is the arts manifestation of human intellectual achievement. But the problem I'm having is defining where arts becomes industry, industry becomes arts, I think, through these different things. Now, I'm going back to first principles. So where, for you, do you see that? Like, for me, I've got a real problem in... Uh, we're losing regional community newspapers to national voices, multinationals. And a lot of the, those journalists write stories that become movies, that become at plays, all these sorts. Of, we're losing a lot of grassroots thing from industry. Where do you see that coming in? Because obviously we're not talking about newspapers here, but I see so much evolving out of that into the arts industry. So my and our approach uh, to arts and culture, which is the phrase that, that we use, yeah 
is broad and inclusive. So it takes in the Sydney Opera House. It also takes in the, the Mullet Festival in Outback New South Wales. Curry, curry, my head. <laughs> um, I'll be there next year. That's um, a bad culture. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm now comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I did it. In <laughs> I didn't actually know that. So I'm yeah. going to take that as a lucky one. <laughs> the uh, so and that includes everything from the, those grassroots community volunteer-based organisations through to a multinational film pr film company. Um, who are producing a global blockbuster. The, I guess the point is that it is inclusive of all of those things, and the questions for government are around what, where, where do you focus your attention in that very broad um, industry and community crossover. It's both a public and a private space. Yeah. yeah. And that's... And specifically, I spoke to a number of people just trying to get up to speed. Different barriers, different... Entry. I think entry yeah. is quite difficult on some stuff, but it's... Those declining ones are what's concerning me because in all these ways, when you go back through, and if I want to look at my family tree, I can go to these regional papers. I see the old stories that happen. We're going to lose that as we lose these country papers, and so we're losing part of our history. We're losing part of our culture as the big guys take on more, and we don't see that. So we're talking regional. We're talking that. Can you see anything to help the declining industries that preserve these arts as well as promoting new stuff? Absolutely. So I will um, provide you with. Um, notice yep. I'll provide some data in terms of uh, the. We have done some analysis breaking out um, the broad cultural and creative industries and the trends in that over time. Certainly, okay. um, the drop in media is visible um, in that material. Okay. We'll, we'll pull that in. Thank you. That. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, well, I think we might um, leave it there, Ms Fielding. Thank you so much for your time. appreciate it. And um, look, we do have a uh, response date for questions on notice of the 18th of April, but if you've got any problems with that, um, contact the Secretariat. Excellent. Thank you okay. so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.